Hi, my name is Daniel. Welcome to Practical TMP, a C++ 17 compile time register machine. Uh, this talk is planned to be 45 minutes long. Uh, I've labeled it a demonstration, but I wanted it to be based on theory and context. So uh, everything leading up to the demonstration at the end will be a lecture uh, with a few breaks in between. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so uh, the big claim that I think a lot of people know is that template metaprogramming is Turing complete. Uh, a brief history of that, uh, in 1994, there was the classic demonstration of a prime number generator. Uh, following that uh, were articles uh, proving Turing completeness, uh, then books, and then metaprogramming libraries, uh, Boost, for example. Okay, so is TMP practical? Uh, <clears throat> the classic, well, one classic example is loop unrolling, uh, but then there's well-known paradigms like the curiously recurring template pattern, as well as uh, substitution failure is not an error. Uh, and then there's more recently compile time regular expressions. Uh, so, Yes, TMP is practical, but what about a Turing uh, machine, well, TMP Turing machine? So with a bit of care, a uh, TMP Turing machine can be practical too. Uh, I frame the solution to this problem uh, as seven bottlenecks. Uh, the first two are theoretical, uh, theoretical in the sense of um, as a bottleneck, what would prevent TMP Turing from being possible. And the first two uh, have to do with uh, the idea of a stack machine. And well, the first, and then the second is continuation passing. Uh, <clears throat> so the remaining five bottlenecks are practical in the sense that what will prevent uh, TMP Turing from being reasonable. Uh, so the third one is the nesting depth, nesting depth problem. Uh, fourth is interoperability, fifth is organizational design, uh, six is debugging, and number seven is performance. So I framed it as bottlenecks because these will inform uh, the remainder of this lecture component. So start with theory, and we start with stack machine. So there are several different ways to implement a function or machine to be Turing complete. Uh, we have to ask the question, which approach makes the most sense in terms of uh, C++ template metaprogramming? Uh, <clears throat> I myself use variadic packs uh, to achieve this goal, which is possible because automata theory tells us that a finite state machine equipped with a two-stack memory system is Turing complete. So what's the relationship between stacks and variadic packs? Um, a side effect of template parameter resolution is the ability to pattern match from the front of a variadic pack. This means we can interpret a pack as a stack and push and pop from the front. So for example, uh, we could define a constant expression function uh, with a parameter pack and have a separate a value at the front. And then when you call that function with an arbitrary pack, um, because of how this is defined, it will pattern match that first value and separate it from uh, the, this w pack. So if we want to impl implement a Turing machine using parameter packs, we need at least two of them. Uh, this is a problem as template scopes only allow directly for one. Uh, <coughs> So uh, this is where constant expression, sorry, constant expression functions come in. Uh, so we have a function here. We have the original stack uh, within the template uh, component. And then we create a second stack uh, within the type of the argument of the function, uh, which also gets represented up here, uh, again, in the stack. 
uh, that's allowing for two. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so the reason two stacks are sufficient to build a Turing machine is because they, in effect, allow random access reading and writing of their memory states, uh, similar to a tape machine. So, for example, uh, going back here, we have our two stacks. Let's say we wanted to uh, access an element in the middle of stack one. We take the uh, front of stack one and put it in front of stack two, and that gives us access to the rest of stack one and the element at its front. Uh, and then we can manipulate and mutate and whatever else from there. And then when we're done, we can put the front of stack one back. And thus we, in effect, have done a random access mutation. Uh, so is that all for stack machine? Uh, there's more. We've described the memory component of these machines, but we still require our constant expression function to be a finite state machine. In automata theory, this is called a transition function. So in terms of regular machine, uh, sorry, in terms of register machine theory, uh, this is called a controller. And our stack machine's controller will be added to the front of the template stack uh, in the sense of this how we're designing it. So we had our stack one and stack two from before, and now we're putting the controller in the front. So what are the controller requirements? Uh, a register machine controller is made up of labels, which are themselves made up of instructions, which forms the basis of the real, of real world assembly languages. Thus, our stack machine also requires a controller language. Um, <clears throat> Although this language uh, can be modeled from any existing assembly language, I've decided to use a modified form of the language provided in Chapter 5 of the classic text Structure Interpretation of Computer Programs. And that looks like this. So you can assign from, well, assign to a register from another register or a constant. Uh, you can assign based on an operation, an apply operation, perform. Uh, we don't need here because it is meant to interact with the input-output system of, well, of the operating system, which we don't have access to. Uh, so when there's test branch, go to, uh, lay, assign again, but from a label. Uh, and then, so there's label and register go to's and then save and restore. Okay, so on to continuation passing. Uh, now that we have our stack machine, how do we actually go from one state of the machine to the next? Um, this is where continuation passing comes in. Uh, in terms of theory, uh, category theory tells us that continuation passing is a monad, which is what we need. Uh, I won't actually be going in, into those details here, but I wanted to make reference to it for anyone who wanted to look further into that. Okay, so the important idea for us uh, is that continuation passing uh, has its own form of composition. So we have a continuation passing function here, and we compose it with another continuation passing function, g. So with f, uh, the idea is we would apply uh, some behavior to the input x, and then the output uh, we would pass it to this function uh, c1. And that's regular continuation passing, but for composition, we would take that output and then pass it to the y component of the function g, which itself would uh, perform some behavior, and then it would pass it to this function c2. So uh, the monad allows us to create composition that acts like composition for regular functions. Um, so what does this mean for us? Uh, we interpret each controller instruction as being symbolic of its own continuation passing function. Uh, this means that our stack machines will perform their intended instructional behavior, uh, but instead of returning directly, they pass the results to the next stack machine. So 
this is our machine from before. Uh, we have our stack, we have a stack, we have our controller. Uh, so it would, uh, the behavior isn't shown in terms of what it's doing, but we assume it would apply some behavior uh, and then it would pass all that information to the next machine instead of returning directly. So for practical reasons, rather than giving these machines their own unique names as constant expression functions, we enclose them in a templated struct. So this is our machine from before. Uh, we rename it as result and we make it a member, a static member function of this struct we now call machine. Um, also note that in theory, we only need one template parameter indexing the name of the machine. Uh, that would be right here. Uh, but in practice, I found it's useful to have a second parameter called a note, which makes it easier to dispatch to variations or optimized versions. So the note would be here. Uh, <clears throat> how do we know what the next machine is? All that information is held in the controller in which case we have two additional requirements. An index telling us where we currently are within the controller, and number two, a dispatch function that knows how to get to the next instruction from the current index. So we have our machine, we have the member function, we have our stacks, so we have our controller here. Uh, now we have an index. Uh, when we call the next machine, we have dispatches calling the, uh, figuring out the name and the note, and then we pass the controller again, uh, and then we pass, or then we uh, figure out the next index, and we pass the stack and heap again. Oh, uh, I didn't mention it earlier. Well, but here uh, I'm naming the variable heap. Um, it's an analogy to actual heaps because it's more expensive to cache this particular stack. And then by putting it here, it can persist uh, across uh, various function calls. So in a lot of ways, it acts like a heap. It's a good way to think about it. At least I think so. So uh, to summarize, we need one dispatch and one indexed uh, to continuation pass. Uh, is that all? In an ideal world, yes. In theory, we can make our dispatch to be generic and our index to be anything, an integer or an array, for example. Uh, in practice, for performance reasons we'll get to later, it's better to have several dispatches and two indices. So we have, instead of one index from before, we now have two. And then our dispatches, instead of naming them individually, uh, we bind them together in a struct or class, and we put that name here so we can just call their respective member functions, uh, which ends up looking like this. So we have our machine, we have the function, dispatches, controller, two indices. Uh, so when we call the next machine, uh, we call the uh, next name, next note, next indices from the dispatch uh, structure. And then to get those values, we require the controller and the indices as input. Uh, as we still have a bit more to add to this general pattern, uh, it's best to simplify our current variables before we continue. So this is the same as we just saw, except I've simplified the variable names. So C is for controller, I is index one, J is index two. Uh, N for next is uh, represents the dispatch uh, struct. Okay, uh, that's it for the theoretical. Uh, let's take a short break. Hi, we're back. So we're continuing on with the practical bottlenecks, starting with the nesting depth problem. So the nesting depth problem is a result of using continuation passing. The 
issue in particular is the unbroken chain of calls that we make to machine after machine, which uh, each call subtracts from the total allowable depth, uh, which runs out quickly as compilers set fairly small default limits. So GCC on my machine, version 8.4, uh, has a limit of 900. Clang is 512, uh, version 6 on my machine. So how do we mitigate this problem? Uh, trampolining, trampolines are the answer. Uh, trampolining is where we return from our continuation passing with an intermediate result. We trampoline before the nesting depth runs out, which allows us to reset the depth back to zero and try again until we're done. How do we apply this to our machines? Uh, we add in one more index variable to the controller. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, right here is the new variable. Uh, so we have our indices i and j, and now we have a depth index. Uh, this also means we have to update our dispatch inventory to include one more function. Uh, so we have our next name, our next note, our next indices, and now we have a uh, next depth. And we've extended the existing dispatches to include the depth variable. So the way these dispatches now work is if our depth counter is greater than zero, we continue to the next machine. Otherwise, we dispatch to a speci specialized machine, which I've named pause, uh, which caches and then returns the intermediate result. It should be noted that in practice, it's best to set our initial counter depth to be smaller than the compilers. So for example, if Clang's 512, then we can set ours to 500. Uh, so for our initial nest, nep Excuse me, uh, if our initial nesting depth is 500, uh, what is the total trampolining depth? Uh, I currently have trampolining implemented such that it subtracts two depths each time it trampolines. If you do the math, uh, it ends up being 62,750 uh, total depths. And is that enough? Uh, for many of these simpler register machines, it should be, but I have at least one test case where it's actually not. Uh, the Fibonacci, well, naive Fibonacci, but I'll get into that later. Uh, when it's not, it's quite straightforward to then write a second trampolining function, which trampolines the first. Uh, such higher order trampolining can then be done as needed. Okay, so our next bottleneck is interoperability. Uh, what is meant by interoperability? Uh, interoperations equals composability. Uh, this was touched on already with continuation passing but it's one thing to pass our data to the next function. Uh, it's another if we need to call an internal function to perform our current instruction. So the bottleneck comes from our nesting depth counter, which is meant to tell us how many depths we have left. But if we call a non-machine function internally as a helper to our machine, we might lose track of how many depths actually remain. So we have a constraint. Uh, no internal function calls are allowed unless they have a known fixed depth. Uh, and there's more on that later. So the solution to this problem then is actually to extend our heap to become its own stack. So originally we had just a single heap here uh, as the second stack of our machine, but now it is a pack of heaps and we pass it to the new machine down here. Uh, so rather than calling independent helper functions, we now restrict ourselves to calling other machines which have their own controllers. We do this by caching our current controller as a heap, as a heap uh, effectively pausing it. Uh, doing things this way means we can not only pass the counter to the helper function that we call, we can still return to our original machine after. Uh, in summary, uh, the only internal functions allowed besides our fixed depth functions are other machines. So is that it for interoperability? Uh, no. There's actually a second bottleneck to consider, the type name versus auto problem. Basically, so far, we have defined our stacks in terms of auto packs, but we could just as well define them in terms of type name packs. So should we be using type name packs instead of auto? Uh, and it's a reasonable idea. Uh, const express functions already exist to do numeric calculations. So if we were to build register machine functions at all, uh, they would probably be used for type name manipulations. Fortunately, we don't have to make this decision. Uh, so there's a type name auto equivalence, which not only allows us to encode auto values as type names, 
this is the traditional way of doing so, but we can also encode type names as auto values, uh, which is implemented here. Uh, the idea is to hide the type name as an input type of a void function, which can later be recovered through pattern matching. So here we have a void const expression function, and it takes the type we're caching as uh, its input type, and otherwise being void, it doesn't actually do anything. But it allows us to store type information as auto variable. Uh, and there are actually a few subtleties to take care of with this approach. Notably, uh, void can't be passed uh, as this type, but the workaround is rather simple uh, and just as performant. Uh, okay, so in any case, because of this, we only really need auto packs for our machines, so we'll stick with those. Okay, um, organizational design as the next bottleneck. So although I didn't mention it earlier, we actually now have the final form for our stack machines. Uh, on, first on first glance, this is a lot to look at, but uh, if you know the narrative, if you know the story behind it, uh, it's pretty straightforward. There's our machine, the name, the note. We have our stack, we have the controller, we have these heaps, uh, and then we have the dispatches to call the next machine. So now that we have our general design for a single machine, there are some questions to bring up. Uh, where do we go from here? How best to build a register machine library? Uh, which specific machines do we choose to make? And how do we organize our machines in this library? So this organization, uh, this is organizational design, uh, but why is it a bottleneck? Uh, without getting to, into these specifics, how a library is organized uh, ends up affecting maintenance, performance, and the ability to debug. Uh, in turn, I have devised the following hierarchy of dependencies for my own library. Uh, so the hierarchy, uh, there's six levels. So we start with block machines, uh, which you can consider atomics, uh, such as pop, push, fold, uh, all from the stack. And they work in blocks, which are powers of two. Uh, from that, you get variadic machines, and these generalize uh, the same operators, pop, push, fold, but now they're arbitrary values, not just powers of two. So we have what I call permutatic machines. Uh, just consider these linear controllers, uh, and they have basic stack heap operators needed for what I call uh, distributed machines, uh, also linear, but these ones have uh, the much needed erase, insert, replace op mutator operators. Uh, next, uh, we have near linear machines, which actually aren't needed to build register machines, but I find, but I find they're a convenient grammar for one cycle loops. Uh, but that's kind of a side point. It's my own personal grammar. So finally, uh, we have register machines. Uh, and that's the more common like branch go to save restore operators that are built on top of the earlier machines. So some stats about this hierarchy. Uh, within my current library, there are 60 different machine names. Uh, there are 195 distinct machines altogether, but two of the modules, block and permutatic, actually account for 158 of these machines, and most of those are optimized variations. Uh, and I just want to note that the optimized forms are actually coded with macros, so I didn't have to hand code all of those myself. Okay, uh, debugging. So debugging is a practical bottleneck for any TMP project. Uh, I think this claim is self-explanatory and generally accepted by anyone who has done uh, TMP, but uh, just to give an idea of the problem, here is an example of a typical uh, template error message. Uh, yikes. So uh, that was GCC. Uh, I'm going to give a Clang example as well, uh, just to say it doesn't really get much better with other compilers. Uh, it's spaced a little bit better, but if you read the whole page, it's, it's just more of the same. Uh, so how do we mitigate this? Uh, at the machine level, we can use basic tools like static cert. Uh, possibly concepts in future very 
uh, versions. Uh, but at the controller, uh, the assembly language level, it actually becomes much more manageable. Uh, to give an example as to why, uh, let's now look at some code from an actual program written with our register machine language. So, uh, on first glance, this is a lot to look at, but it, uh, it's pretty, or quite readable. So we have our controller, uh, in particular it's a filter controller, where we take a variadic pack and filter out the objects we don't want to keep. So our controller is split into these three labels, uh, is loop end, pop value, return pack. And so for example, is loop end, we start by testing if there's a variable n is equal to the constant zero. If it is, we go to return pack down here. Otherwise, we uh, decrement uh, sub for subtract. Um, and then we check the condition or, or check the value we're interested in for the condition. And if it matches, then we pop the value. Well, we go to pop value and it erases. Otherwise, we rotate, rotate it to the back of the pack to keep it for later. And, and then we repeat. So the debugging becomes reasonable at this level because we now have access to a long history of well-known debugging techniques. The first of which is the naive approach where we add in temporary print instructions and, or a temporary print instruction and step through each line, uh, rerunning or recompiling until the program breaks. So this is the label is a loop from before. Uh, I've just inserted a stop instruction here just returning the value. And so if we get this far and we get the value, then we know things are working fine. Well, I say no, but that's its own problem. Um, anyway, uh, we go to the next step after that and we try again and we keep doing that until we find the point where it breaks. As I said, this is the naive approach. Uh, beyond it, uh, we could also write compile time debuggers to go through the uh, these controller style programs and report bugs the way real compilers would. Uh, it should be noted that I don't currently have any such tools implemented for my library, uh, but I'm open to adding them in later versions, later versions if people show interest. Uh, lastly, there is an additional reason the designs presented so far are effective at mitigating bugs. Uh, they share a common form across machines. Uh, because of this, uh, C macros can be used to simplify the source code redundancy. They reduce the chance of accidentally introducing typos or semantic bugs, uh, which might otherwise not be caught by the compiler. Uh, and we will break here. Hi, welcome back. So we've reached the final bottleneck, which is performance. Uh, I think the question many would like to know at this point is whether or not this design is performant. Uh, I claim it is, but I have only recently finished the release candidate for version 1.0 of my library, and unfortunately I do not have any benchmarks at this time. Uh, I make this claim though because I have adhered to several key optimization paradigms throughout. So for starters, there is the block optimization paradigm. Uh, this innovation comes from Olden Holmes who talks about it on his blog. He uses the name fast tracking. Uh, the idea of blocking is to perform calculations on variadic packs in powers of two blocks uh, rather than just one at a time. So for example, uh, normally you have your variadic pack and you might uh, pattern match the first uh, object, uh, but instead you can do uh, powers of two. So here we have four or you know, 8, 16, 32, so on. Uh, and uh, these make up the block optimization, uh, what, the block module of the machine hierarchy. Uh, so this optimization works by turning a linear algorithm into a logarithmic one, creating orders of magnitude speedups. Uh, it should be noted that the savings don't come from the block processing itself. Uh, every time info is passed from one machine to the next, uh, that info is copied. Blocking works largely because we are copying exponentially less info. So also note that blocking performs on auxiliary optimization in that it saves on nesting depths. So 
Next is the mutator optimization. Uh, a complete register machine requires many individual instructions to make it work, but there's still a core of mutator instructions such as erase, insert, replace, that in general are used more often than the rest. Uh, in this design, these mutators have both their general purpose versions, but they also have versions optimized for the first eight registers. So there's machine call optimization. Uh, since each machine shares the same name, calling the next machine is achieved either through overload resolution or class specialization, or a combination of both. Uh, having tested these variations, I've found the hybrid approach of using class specialization for names and notes and function overloading for the registers achieves orders of magnitude increases for our machine calls. Uh, dispatch optimization. The controller dispatchers serve not only to move from one machine to the next, they also act as optimizers. Uh, they help mitigate the nesting depth problem by requiring less calls. Uh, less machine calls also means less stack copying. Finally, uh, although it's only currently anecdotal, I will add that the small programs I've built generally run in the range of one to two seconds uh, for small and medium input and are much slower than the more direct cons express implementations. Uh, as this might not be entirely convincing, it is finally time for some demonstrations. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so I decided to do three demonstrations, uh, the factorial function, Fibonacci function, and filtering with, well, plus comp, uh, function composition. Uh, you'll have to bear with me. I am new at this setup. Okay. So, uh, to start, I would like to get a baseline going. So if we get rid of all this and actually uh, comment that out, uh, we just have a main function. Uh, so it compiles uh, 0.25 seconds. When I've run it before, it normally compiles uh, 0.16, but there's going to be some little small variations. So if we now include see standard IO. So GCC compiles 0.33 seconds, clang 0.34. Okay, so I've added everything back. And so we have a main function down here, but everything is commented out. So I'm going to run this. I didn't save. Uh, okay, do that again. So now it's running 1.34 seconds, 1.62 seconds. Uh, in the past, I actually usually average at like 0.83 seconds. So I think there's something else running on the machine that's slowing it down a little. Uh, in any case, um, that's the third baseline, which just shows that it takes almost a second uh, normally just to read in the library uh, without even actually doing anything. And that's a uh, sunk cost, uh, but I don't think it's horribly unreasonable. Okay, so we start with the factorial function. Uh, we have our controller right here. This is the naive factorial. So we have the labels. Uh, and then as for the variables, the way they work, I didn't really show this before, but the way they work is uh, you define your names and then you set the values uh, to numbers in order. Uh, they represent the register numbers. So this is the zeroth register, the first register, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, so on. And then the labels uh, start a similar way, except you the index starts at one. Okay, so this is the naive factorial, uh, and factorial by definition is equal to n times n minus one. If you define it like that, uh, basically you're putting a lot of uh, 
functions on the stack. And it is not constant memory. So if we go to the machine, or sorry, uh, the main, and we want to test it out. Uh, I wrote some print functions here, just um, convenience functions for printf. And, and these comments uh, are just the first values, uh, just for show. So 5 factorial is 120. Uh, so we run that. That runs at 1.64 seconds and clangs a little bit slower. Uh, it usually is. Uh, so for GCC, that's a difference of about 0.3 seconds. And that's generally about right uh, for the tests I've run. So for example, you can do 8 factorial. So 2 seconds. And the highest you can go is 20 factorial for this implementation, because otherwise you get arithmetic overload for 2.94 seconds. And Clang's running a bit slower. Clang's not exactly twice as slow, but close to it uh, in GCC. I assume it's because it's doing a lot of optimization that probably doesn't have to. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure as a as I don't know the Clang engine. Okay, um, so Fibonacci. Uh, Fibonacci is the naive Im implementation as well. Uh, we have the same setup here. Define your registers, give them names, and you have the logic controller here. Uh, <coughs> this is the naive Fibonacci. So uh, naive factorial uses, I would say, what well, linear memory. So naive Fibonacci uses uh, exponential memory. So, and then this is just a convenience function setting it up and calling the actual machine. Uh, this one too just sets the nesting depth. But in any case, because this is the naive implementation, it's gonna be a lot slower. So even just uh, Fibonacci at value five, that would run see. Yeah, 3.35 seconds. Sorry, I'm not rounding to the right decimal place. Uh, and Fibonacci actually, uh, I tested it out uh, just as a test case. Uh, it goes up to 13 uh, Fibonacci, and then once you hit 14, it actually reaches its nest nesting depth, which previously I stated was uh, what sixty two thousand seven hundred fifty. Uh, so, yeah, all those memory calls are adding to the nesting depth or subtracting from it. Uh, so, you know, if you decide to use these register machines, uh, they won't help you implement the fastest possible version of a program. Uh, that you have to do yourself. Okay. So finally, uh, filtering and function composition. So uh, in earlier in the talk and in the slides, uh, we went over a the filtering controller. So that's the same controller here. Uh, I wanted to give this as an example, uh, as it's closer to a real world example that I myself would use. Uh, so let's say I define a square function here and I want to compose some functions ahead of time, uh, uh, runtime functions ahead of time. And uh, for convenience, I have uh, just an identity keyword. Uh, notice how it doesn't have any types. Well, it's a void out and no, well, void in, void out. And so for example, I can define a compose function. Uh, and this is do compose, so the only difference between it and regular compose is it reads from left to right. So here you take the input, you square it, you square it again, and you multiply by two, and then you add by one, 
and that uh, represents uh, 2x to the 4 plus 1. Uh, but then at some point it might be convenient to define an abstract variable uh, or insert an identity function. Uh, but it's annoying having to uh, specify the type. So just for like convenience, uh, I like to use this identity keyword and then have my compile time register machine uh, just filter it out and then finish the composition. Uh, all of that is written as a register machine as well. So the second function, uh, add by one, multiply by three, uh, then identity map and then square. So that's uh, three times x for one or x plus one, uh, all squared. So if we go here, uh, and we can apply this uh, two x to the four, uh, five to the four is what six twenty five. Uh, so then we have uh, twelve fifty twelve fifty one. All 51. Okay. So that runs 1.26 seconds, uh, 1.64 seconds, or 62 seconds for Clang. And the same thing here uh, with the second function, which filters out the identity. Okay. So yeah. Uh, 1.47 and 1.68. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that's it for the demonstration. Just one moment. Okay. Well, actually, I wanted to mention uh, those last two functions. Those are actual runtime functions. So, uh, yeah. So it's not just compile time. Uh, in any case, um, just to finish up, uh, there are just a few caveats. Um, there might be undefined behavior in my library. I bring this up uh, because, I mean, technically all these register machines are just like one big hack of uh, the C++ type system. Uh, and it's possible there's undefined behavior within uh, that I'm not, that I may have missed. So if you decide to use this yourself, uh, just be aware of that. Uh, and then uh, there are still some open questions. Uh, for example, how many heaps should we include uh, in our machine design? Uh, at the moment I have two, but I might add uh, uh, two default ones, uh, but then I might add uh, one or two more. Uh, then also, uh, which supplementary machines to add to this library uh, in the long run? Uh, for example, I would like to add some string operations, uh, like optimized string operations. I can do a lot of string manipulations. Uh, <clears throat> other than that, uh, some references. But um, so that is my talk. Uh, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed it.